As you probably know, another election is heating up in the United States. If you are not aware of this, God bless you. I want to get under the rock with you. When my brother moved to Australia, he was trying to figure out how to, I don't know, be Australian, Mandy. Now, he didn't really want to do that. Cause that'd be, but he was trying to understand the Australian context and how to vote there. He is a citizen. And he found that every time he tried to talk about Australian politics, all the Aussies just wanted to talk about Trump and Obama and these things. And he was like, I want to know about Australian politics. But American politics tend to shape a lot of the discussion around the world, whether we like it or not. And as I said, it's another election heating up, although it kind of just feels like there's always an election in America. I'm not sure it's ever not happening. People aren't ever kind of campaigning. But sometimes I think the candidates are so focused on who they're against, they forget who they're for. They're supposed to be for the people, but it seems like so often the attacks are really between the candidates. It's like they're fighting a war against each other. And even then, the constituents, the voters, begin to think that they're against each other, and it's an us versus them. And it just becomes quite a figurative bloodbath. But I reflected on that as I was thinking about today's sermon where Paul is telling them that your battle is not against flesh and blood. And I thought about the people in Ephesus. And you've seen this map every week. But there they are in Ephesus. They're in what we would call the Near East. Uh, this is not a term that they would have used. It's, it's the, the Arab world, although it's touching on Europe. You know, Turkey is always trying to say they're Europe, but we all know they're kind of not. It's that in-between area, right? Well, it's been like that for ages. So here you've got the, the Italians, the Latins, the Roman Empire. You've got the Greeks. And then over here, you've got the Arab world. And Ephesus is this, this meeting place. And you've got a lot of the Jewish diaspora, people who are Jewish heritage living there. Just like today, we have people more than ever are on the move. This last week, there was a Global Diaspora Network annual meeting. My friend TV Thomas leads that. He was in the video as well. Jakob, who's building the new community center and church in, in Hanoi that we're helping out. We're going to be a part of that. Uh, he was in the video. He's speaking, though, as a key speaker there because people on the move in international churches are completely linked. So we work a lot with the Global Diaspora Network. It's part of Lausanne. But as people are on the move, we have all of these, these diasporas. And so we have people, for example, we say there's more Norwegians in America than in Norway. Right? That's the Norwegian diaspora. And if they're close enough linked to their heritage, they still at least know how to make good waffles. Right? So there's certain pieces of that. Right? Samson would claim that your family is part of the Ugandan diaspora. Pamela and the kids, yes. You, we're not so sure. But, but this is the thing. We, many of us are part of some kind of diaspora where we're living in a country that may not be where we're from. And so we, we adapt to the country, but we bring certain parts of our culture with us. And that was happening in Ephesus, not just with the Jewish population, but with different ones, with North Africa being right there. You've got Egyptians. You've got people over the Cypriots. You've got, I mean, all kinds of people are coming and, and, and melding together in these, in, in these international churches, which is really what the first churches, many of them were, were international churches. Um, but then, you can imagine they may have felt like they were against the world. They were feeling like Caesar was overreaching, there was other forces at bay, and so there can be the sense that it's us against them. And Paul reminds them that their war was not against Caesar. Their war was not against the local governor. Their war was not against the other immigrants that they were worried about taking their jobs or whatever. Their war was against a spiritual realm. And it's a reminder that we need today because so often we too get focused on earthly things that are so lowly and so temporary. But they're just not going to matter 50 years from now. A lot of the things we spend time on and argue about and fight about won't matter. But there are spiritual things going on that will have an impact on eternity. And so Paul wants them to get their attention right. And the, and the devil, the enemy, would like nothing more than to distract us with fighting ourselves. The biggest thing that tears churches apart, sadly, is not attacks from the outside. It's not outside persecution. There's a number of countries where there's plenty of persecution going on, and yet still the leading cause of church splits is internal strife where Christians are fighting other Christians. 
instead of focusing on carrying the gospel forward. And so we're going to look at this and see how Paul builds his argument today. And I think it's quite interesting where he starts. So let's pray, and then we're going to read through most of Ephesians chapter 6 in pieces today. God, we thank you again for this book. We thank you for Paul and his writing it to those at Ephesus and probably to circulate among other churches. And we see the relevance is still here today as your world, word is eternal and you continue to have a meaning for us. And, and reality is, as, as Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. And so the things that were happening in Ephesus are happening in some way today in Norway, in America, in Australia, and all these other countries. Uh, many of those things just continue to repeat themselves. And so, Father, may we be people who are spiritually minded but have an earthly impact for your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's where he starts. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is a good Sunday to have kids in here. <laughs> For this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, he starts with kids having the right respect for their parents. It's interesting. We're about to get into the spiritual realm. Why is he starting with these earthly relationships? He then, of course, also says, hey, fathers, don't provoke your kids unnecessarily. Don't make it harder on them than it needs to be. But then he goes on and he says, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. In other words, not just trying to appear like you're working hard, not trying to just when the boss is looking, but to honestly do the best job you can, doing the will of God from the heart. Interesting that he says the will of God lines up with the will of your boss here. And he says, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. So as if Jesus himself is your boss, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. So we're not doing it because we expect the raise or the promotion, although those things may happen, but we expect that we're going to receive it back from the Lord, which Jesus has promises that are both of this world and the world to come. And so even if we get the raise or promotion, ultimately we give the glory to God and thanks to him. And there's also eternal and spiritual rewards. Whether he is a bondservant or is free, masters do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. What I find so interesting here is that it starts with earthly relationships, this passage. Apparently they have spiritual significance. If you can't get your earthly relationships right, how can you expect to get your spiritual ones sorted? If you are constantly fighting with your kids or your parents or your boss or your employees, how are you going to have any kind of a spiritual impact? How are you going to have any effectiveness against Satan, against the, the powers in the spiritual realm, when you can't even sort out the day-to-day -day earthly things? I think it's very intentional that Paul starts here. Right? He doesn't write this by accident. The Spirit did not inspire him haphazardly. But there is a purpose and a reasoning for how the Scriptures unfold. And so I think it's worth taking note that our spiritual impact starts at home. And then it starts next in the workplace or the community. Now we're going to get into the spiritual, this more spiritual sounding talk. We started reading it earlier. The armor of God and the heavenly places. But some people want to skip over the other. They want to skip over these very rational, very simple, down-to-earth statements. And here's what's also to me is, is almost mind-blowing, is the things that we do in our families and the things we do at work, those things are a witness not just to the people around us, they are a witness and a statement to the forces in the spiritual realm. Now, for some of you, our Nigerians are going like, yeah, this is basic, David. Some of our other Westerners are like, oh, this is weird. Right, depending on your background, the idea of spiritual warfare and the spiritual realm, you may have a different level of comfort. But we're just looking at what Scripture says here. And he starts out with the, what's very comfortable to all of us. We all understand having a family, if you do have one. We understand having work relationships. And we could take this and I think extrapolate it into other relationships too. Whether it's in the parent association at the school or whether it's in the community or, or a club that you're a part of. In all of those things, those earthy relationships are something that we are doing as service to God. 
This is not apart from it. What we do here on a Sunday is not your spiritual life and the other rest of the week is somehow your physical earthly life. This is just where we recharge. The church is like lungs that breathe you in on a Sunday and then breathe you back out into the world, right? We need that breath. We need to come in and go out. We need both. We can't live here as much as some of you would like to just be able to stay here and say, can, can faith just sing all week? Can we just do that? But we can't because we'd be no use to the world. We also can't stay in the world all the time or like we talked about last week, we may lose our saltiness. So we've got to have that recharge time. We've got to be back out there. And we need to be perceptive that what you're dealing with in the world is part of the spiritual warfare. And I think sometimes, or maybe probably a lot of the time, the enemy is more aware of that than you are. And so the enemy is throwing things at you in the workplace or in the family, and you're thinking of it as earthly, and the enemy is winning a spiritual war, and you're trying to find an earthly one with your kids. And you're missing what's really going on around you. Two more verses here. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, what I find interesting here is he hasn't gotten into the spiritual things. He's just talked so far, I mean, in what we would think is spiritual things. It is spiritual, everything's spiritual, but he's been talking about these earthly relationships. And then he says, okay, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. We even need the Lord's strength for those earthly relationships. But also, he tells us to put on the whole armor of God, and he hasn't yet talked about the outright spiritual warfare. And a, a, a quote comes to mind by Norman uh, Schwarzkopf, where he said, The more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. The way I'm applying this is, so often we aren't mindful of our spiritual armor, we aren't mindful of the spiritual battle until things get really bad. And then we're not ready for it, and we bleed. And it's really tough. It's like weightlifting, right? After the service today, I'm going to need a few strong men to lift this piano up and put it up here. Samson cut his hair this morning, so his strength is gone. So he said he needs help. <laughs> but if you're just finding out about this now, and you're like, ah, oh, shoot, I want to help out. I don't want to look weak up there against the other guys, and so you're going to go run out and start lifting weights, it's not going to do you a lot of good. You need to be lifting weights for the last number of weeks or months so that you're strong when the time comes to lift the piano, right? In the same way, when it comes to spiritual warfare, we can't wait until things get tough and go, oh, I better get right with God. I probably should read my Bible. I probably should have prayed this week. Like, not that it's too late, not that God can't come through for you, but it's going to be a lot harder than if you stay prepared. Because you don't know when the enemy is going to attack. You don't know when the enemy is going to attack you or your family or your friends or something else you're dealing with. And so you can't, you can't go be lax about it. You can't be lazy going, I don't think I need to work out this week spiritually. I mean, it's summer. Isn't the devil on summer break too? Or like, is the devil down like south because it's summer in Norway and so you're not supposed to be at work here? Like, no, we need to be ready to stand against those schemes of the devil. Now, schemes of the devil is an interesting um, a phrase, and we see different schemes throughout Scripture. As we've talked about many times here at our church, when you want to understand a spiritual principle, you always go back to the first time it comes up. So I'm going to actually not use those references, but go straight to Genesis. We see the serpent here saying to Eve, speaking of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God said not to eat from, he said, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what does it sound like? It sounds like the serpent is giving Eve exactly what she wants. As a matter of fact, it even kind of sounds like what God said. God said he was making people in his image, right? We're supposed to want to be like God. But the devil is offering a counterfeit experience, which is so often what the devil does. He offers something that looks like that of God, but is counterfeit. He can do that through religious practices. He can do that through offering things that you think you want. He can, there's all kinds of ways the devil can be crafty and cunning. He's not always the destroyer of worlds. He's not always the one that's out there. there is a, he does come to steal, kill, and destroy, but he's crafty about how he goes about it. So we need to understand those schemes. We need to be aware. Very often the devil and those who are, whether they mean to be following him or not, being used by him, they have a silver tongue. 
It sounds good. It sounds nice. On the other hand, we read in 2 Corinthians, or on the same idea, 2 Corinthians, it says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. If you read more of 2 Corinthians 11, you'll see that Paul is talking about those who serve Satan, Antichrist. Not what we call the Antichrist, but those who are against Christ. And that they also, like Satan, appear pleasing at times. Now, on the other hand, 1 Peter tells us, Be sober-minded. And be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. So here we have a promise of how God will strengthen us and keep us, but we see the idea of the devil as a roaring lion. And I think Satan is more cunning than we realize. Lars sent me a video this week of an event that happened in South Africa where a woman lost her child and couldn't find him, alerted the authorities. They found the child in a bag in a truck along with other children. The children were all saved, fortunately, but they were taken away for human sacrifices. A lot of people don't realize this is quite common, and it's not just South Africa. It's things we've run into in Nepal. We've run into this in South Asia. We've run into this across Africa. And so th this, this is still happening. The devil is seeking out people to destroy. But it doesn't always look like that. That's not going to fly in Norway, and the devil knows how to adapt tactics to different places. But we also should not be unaware thinking that these things don't happen, not realizing the kind of sorcery, the kind of, of magic that still happens in many parts of the world. There are all kinds of things going on that you may not be aware of, but if you spend a little time, travel a little bit with me, and we'll find some of it. There's still animal sacrifices, blood drinking, all kinds of stuff that we come across, and it's, it's demonic. And there are demonic forces that empower it. And there are demonic things that happen, spiritual things that are beyond what would happen in the natural realm. But again, if the devil gets you to not believe he exists and just to fight each other, well, then he's already won. Sun Tzu in The Art of War said, If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. Sun Tzu goes on, he says, If you know yourself, but not the enemy... For every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. I bring this up because it's actually good advice for us that we need to know ourselves. And, and Ephesians has done a lot of establishing who are we in Christ. Who is Christ? How do we understand he who is the light? And we who have become light and salt in the earth. But we also need to understand the enemy. And Paul is doing this. He's outlined who we are, spent more time on that and who Christ is, because we don't need to focus on the devil. I've been with people, they focus so much time on Satan, I'm like, well, no, 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 we, we have the victory, but we do need to be aware. We need to be aware of what's going on, and so it's important that we are conscious of it. The next verse says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly places. Now, there is struggles that are happening between flesh and blood around us all the time. This isn't what God wants from humanity. God doesn't desire us to war with each other. There are times where war has been necessary. We see it in Scripture, times where we've had to defend a nation. But it's not what is on God's heart for people. That's because of sin. I've not seen the Oppenheimer movie, but it's been doing quite well in theaters. And one of the quotes... One of his actual quotes in real life, he says, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The science was interesting. It was, it was fantastic to pursue. But obviously it unleashed things in the earth that now we realize you know, during the Cold War that everything could be destroyed. It's one of the reasons the situation in Ukraine is, is difficult strategically because Russia has nukes. Putin has rattled that saber. Albert Einstein said this, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Sobering, isn't it? Oppenheimer went on to say, the peoples of this world must unite or they will perish. 
And I would say it's even more important we think about the people in the church, so the people of Christ. So often we don't have each other's backs. We're not there to help each other. We need to encourage. We need to hold accountable. We need to sometimes bring discipline. But we need to be there for each other because we, we desire the best for one another. We're supposed to consider others as better than ourselves. We're supposed to be able to, to serve one another, to love others as we love ourselves. And so we need the same thing. Otherwise, when the devil creates division then he's creating a winning strategy for himself because we do the fighting for him. Humanity, even those who are not believers, we should not ever see them as the enemy. Whether they're terrorists, whether they're on a foreign army, sometimes they may have to be fought as the enemy, but we should understand them as prisoners of war. I've been to Hanoi on a couple of times, but this last year I got to go to the Hanoi Hilton, as it was called, where many of the prisoners of war were kept during what we call the Vietnam War, what they call the American War. But actually what struck me most was seeing the treatment of the Vietnamese prisoners under the French, because this was not a new prison built by the Vietnamese. This was used by the French as they colonized the Vietnamese to squelch a political dissent. And the torture that went on and the mistreatment is, is horrifying, and in some ways it's no surprise they turned around and did the same to others. We have spiritual principles that apply here. The Bible says we love because God first loved us. We can also say the reverse is true. People who are, people who are abused often abuse others. And so there's this terrible just cycle of sin. But as we go through, and as you, if you ever go and you visit, or if you visit other places where prisoners of war have been kept, it comes to mind that really everybody who doesn't know Jesus is a prisoner of war. They need to be freed. They don't need to be beat. Yes, we may argue, may debate about things, but it's not because we want to win. It's because we want to win them over. It's because we want to win their souls. because we want them to meet Jesus. And so there's a, sometimes a mentality change. Because I see Christians who are often afraid of the world. They're often afraid of engaging. They're afraid of those who have different opinions than them. And, and instead of realizing, look, we've already won. In Christ we have victory. The question is how many prisoners of war are you going to take with you? You can't win anymore by destroying other people. But you can win by introducing them to Christ. And so even the, and, and, and many of us come from cultures where there may be a country that's your neighbor country that you don't like. Right? We have many of those rivalries around the world. And I'm trying to think of one that I can mention that doesn't involve anyone here. And pretty much I'll step in it no matter what. But the reality is we should actually want the best for those people too. Right? So we need to understand that they're all prisoners of war, and even if they've done terrible things, or their people have done terrible things, or our people, ultimately they're not the enemy. There's an enemy behind it, and they're the ones we want to rescue and bring to our side. And these are the spiritual forces that are in the heavenly places. We read a little bit about this in Daniel. It was too much for me to put up on the screen, so I'll just read it here. Daniel chapter 10, verses 10 through 13. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. And then in verse 20, then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side except these, Michael, your, except the, against these except Michael, your prince. So here we have a peek into the spiritual realm. We see that there are things going on around us. Even our prayers as we're praying, there may be spiritual forces that are against those prayers being answered. And of course, God is all powerful, but he allows us to have a part in this and he allows the angelic forces to have a part. And what it's like for them to fight, we don't fully understand. But we need to be aware that that's happening. Daniel was encouraged to say, look, your prayers were not meaningless. They weren't ineffective. It just took time because there's things happening in the spiritual realm that you're unaware of. David understood this when he fought Goliath. He says to him, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand." He understood there was more going on in the spiritual realm. It wasn't just about the battle that was happening on the field in front of him. And his goal was to make God known. Ephesians chapter 6, we continue, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now there's a lot of things we could say about this and we could probably do a sermon on every single one of the pieces. And we're not going to do that today because it's just not time to go through the entire spiritual armor. But we see this idea of being equipped. We also see that in those verses and so far that we've read in Ephesians we've seen the word stand three times. The idea of standing firm. It's, it's not telling us to charge ahead. It says to stand firm. We are standing at the edge of the kingdom as we bring the kingdom and the light to this world. The darkness will not overcome it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Fear would lead soldiers to run away. The armor that was, they were wearing, the breastplate, the shin guards, these things were on the front. If they ran away, they opened themselves to attack. We're being told to not fear. If we read in Joshua chapter 1, when Joshua was encouraged over and over, be strong and courageous. Where he would put his feet, God would give him. There's this idea of we stand, we, the battle is the Lord's, as David said, but we stand firm. You may have heard the, the idea through in different quotes from different generals throughout history where they talk about don't shoot until you see the white of their eyes. Right? It's the standing firm as the enemy approaches. That actually was originated by a certain king, King Gustavus Adolphus, the father of modern warfare. And this is what he commanded his troops. And I guess in light of what I was preaching on, I have to give credit that he's Swedish. So... But he was the father of modern warfare, and in the 1600s, he, he commanded his troops. He said, never give fire till you can see your own image in the pupil of your enemy's eye. It takes great courage to stand and stand firm as you're about to be attacked. It's interesting as well that the sword is the only weapon that's mentioned. Everything else is defensive, and that sword is the Word of God. Hebrews tells us the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and a spirit of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And in John 18, we see Jesus speak, literally the Word of God. Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. The word of God, whether it's being spoken out of Jesus' mouth, or we're talking about the scripture that we can read, this is the weapon. This is what the Spirit uses to stir people's hearts. This is the desire, again, is, is what will convict and what will change the hearts of men. It's not a weapon that is there to destroy, but rather it's a, a weapon that's there to pierce that the Spirit might have a way in to their hearts. And it's a reminder that Jesus has already won. He's already been victorious. We've already read Ephesians 1, but in Ephesians 1 it says, What is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places? Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now I want you to check this out. Clearly, Jesus has already won, right? We have the resurrection, we have the ascension. Jesus is there, right hand of the Father. And it says that he's over all the rulers. It says, though, that all things have been put under his feet. Then it says his body, which includes his feet, is the church. So what does that say about our own spiritual authority? What does that say about the power that we're called to walk in? 
But why don't we? It's either because we don't recognize the spiritual war that's going on, or we don't have the faith, or we don't understand the authority that we have in Christ. But it says here that all of these authorities have been put under our feet. God has given you authority over the forces of darkness, and yet so often we don't take that authority up. And that would be a whole other sermon. Colossians 2.15, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. That's already been done. Jesus exists outside of the space-time continuum as we know it. What is going on in the heavenly places has been accomplished, and yet it's happening at the same time in what we understand as the passage of time. Here's an illustration of a U.S. fighter fighting a bunch of Japanese planes. There's a quote from Wilbur Spider, quote-unquote Spider Webb, that was his nickname. He was fighting near Guam, and he said this quote. Any American fighter near Orita Peninsula, I have 40 Jap planes surrounded and need a little help. He was alone. That's some confidence. But that should be our attitude as well. That even if it's us against the spiritual forces of darkness, we have them surrounded. We should not fear. We should be courageous and stand strong because we have the victory in Christ already. And at the end, he encourages us to pray. He tells us, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. We see all four times in that text. We see the idea that we need to have all times that we're praying in the Spirit. It's all prayer and supplication. And we also see it's all perseverance. We don't give up. We continue to the end. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And it says all the saints. Throughout Ephesians, this theme of unity comes up over and over again. That God desires us to be united with all the saints. One last Oppenheimer quote before we close. He said, The optimist thinks this is the best of all possible worlds. The pessimist fears it is true. The reality is we know as believers that we want to make the best of this world. We are called to bring the best, to be peacemakers, to bring reconciliation. We are called to take the chaos and bring order. So from the very beginning in Genesis, to take the wilds and turn it into a garden. But we also know that the best is yet to come. Not that we hope blindly that it's an empty hope or a wishful thinking, but we have hope and faith that truly the best is yet to come and that we are doing our part. While it is day, while there is light, we do what God calls us to do, but we trust Him for the results and the fruit, knowing that we are on our way to something even better. Throughout this series, we've had six different questions. Where are you? Well, we talked about how where we are in our context of anger, or if you move somewhere else, affects us. It affects our calling. But we also recognize we are standing at the edge of the kingdom in Christ. We are there as the salt and light, taking the kingdom further. We want His kingdom to come, His will to be done. His kingdom is wherever His will is being done. Why are you? We are called to do good works that are all a part of a spiritual battle. Who were we? We were orphans of darkness. Who are we? We are royal children of God's with rights and privileges. The authority that we walk in as part of His body. What are we? We are salt and light. And who's against us? Satan and his demonic forces. And so our next steps, three questions as we close. How aware are you of the spiritual realm? What might be going on around you that you're blind to? And Satan is quite happy to leave you blind. How well are you wearing the armor and how can you be better equipped? Now we went through that passage very quickly, but I would encourage you, take time this week to read through it. Maybe read a commentary on those pieces of armor. There's a lot we could say about each piece and what Paul is telling us about these different aspects in our life. And then I would just close with, with the last question, which was where we ended there in that passage. Are you faithful in your prayer life? I mean, Paul makes a big point about praying for all the saints. Now that's a lot of saints. 
How are you doing praying for your family? How are you doing praying for your church family? How are you doing praying for leaders at our church? Like, let's just start there. How faithful are you in your prayer life and how can maybe you improve there? Because that's one of the places, both the, the, the human relationships, which I probably should have put up here as well, that we started with. That's a great place to start. How are you bringing glory to God? How are you sorting those out appropriately under Christ? But then also a next place to start in your spiritual warfare is your prayer life. And it reminds you of the C.S. Lewis quote where C.S. Lewis said, I pray not that God might change, that I pray not that I might change God, I pray that God might change me. How are we going to be aware of the spiritual battle around us if we're not tuned into the spirit? So that's where it starts. It starts with the recognition of the spiritual realm. And so I encourage you to take these on, at least choose one of these to say, let me focus on that this week. How can I improve in that area so I can be more fit? Like we said earlier, the more you sweat in peacetime, maybe things are a struggle for you right now, or maybe things are good. But if they are good, don't let that make you lazy. Sweat during that time so that you can be ready for whatever is coming. Because there will be challenges that come in your life. Let's pray as the team comes back up for a final song of response. God, we thank you that you have won the war. You've, you've won the battle. And so what you've called us to is, is not that we have to fight in our own strength, but we fight in your strength. We just take on the authority you've given us as your ambassadors, as your children. Father, help us to be aware of the spiritual war that's around us. Help us to not be lulled into a, a lethargy that we're too comfortable because we don't see it around us in Norway where things can seem so comfortable at times. And yet there is a spiritual war raging even right here around us in Stavanger. God, may we be your warriors of light. May we be bringing light into the darkness and piercing that darkness, Father. And may we be using your word that there might be a, 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 a place for your spirit to get into the hearts of men and women around us that more might come to know you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.